I wonder what kind of a world we're opening the door on. You'd wonder even more if you saw the pictures of Mars that we saw last night. Ice caps, thousands of feet high, melted away in a few days. Oh, those people must use atomic power as we use water. The Red Planet. It's become something of an enigma. Our planetary neighbour, which stands out in the sky thanks to its distinctive red tinge. Mars is an ancient, lonely planet, with stories of what was once a much more familiar world written all over its surface. Today, however, it lies dead and barren. But now, civilization is verging on an astonishing breakthrough. With the Earth in uncharted territory, mankind has started to peer upwards, beyond the blue dot and towards the red one, looking to make Mars our next home. But this is an unforgiving, inhospitable world, a dusty, torrid planet of vast deserts and towering mountains. Yet it hasn't always been this desolate. Beneath its scarred surface, it is hiding the secrets of a lost oasis, a world like the one we know today, which prevailed long before life was established on the Earth. Mars is the fourth furthest planet from the Sun, and the outermost of the rocky terrestrial planets. It is considerably smaller than the Earth, being only about half the size and only 10% as massive. It is the second smallest planet in the solar system after Mercury, and its moons are also among the smallest of their kind. However, while the red planet appears small from the outside, it is less so on the surface. It has taller mountains, deeper canyons, and a far older landscape than on Earth. Mars has been seen since ancient times. It is the second brightest object in the night sky after Venus, and even brighter when the two planets draw closer to one another every few years. From Earth, Mars's standout feature has always been its red colouring. That's where it gets its name. Mars is the name of the Roman god of war, and red is associated with blood spilled in battle. The Sumerians, a civilization who existed around 5,000 years ago, knew of Mars as a god in the sky. From there, mankind continued to study its movements, and by ancient Egypt, some 1,500 years before the Common Era, they had noticed its retrograde orbit against the stars. It remained this way right up until the 19th century, when our telescopes finally became good enough to make out features on the planet. In 1877, Giovanni Schiaparelli used a telescope in Milan to help produce the first detailed map of the Martian surface. What he noted were these long streams he called canali, which he speculated were full of water. This, combined with the knowledge that other astronomers had noticed changes in the dark patches on Mars's surface which appeared to be seasonal, led to a long-held belief that Mars was another living world in the solar system, with a biosphere like ours. The dark patches were thought to be vegetation, with the canali transporting water up and down the planet from the poles. Unfortunately, these canali were found to be nothing more than just an optical illusion caused by these earlier telescopes, but from there on, the everlasting association between Mars and its so-called Martians was formed. And so, with the promise of so much to be discovered on Mars, we began devising ways to get there. Today, Mars is the most explored world beyond the Earth. Scores of missions, both Western and Soviet, studied the planet in the late 20th century. In 1964, the US Mariner 4 spacecraft became the first probe to successfully fly by and photograph the planet. Finally, we had authentic visual observations, but what we found completely broke our perceptions. Mariner 9 revealed that the so-called shifting seasonal vegetation were actually eruptions of dust and gas, and dust storms whipped across the face of the planet. Far from the vision of a living world, Mars is dead and deserted. The Viking spacecraft then became the first probe to successfully land on its surface, sending back the first picture of its arid, rocky terrain. Maps of the surface have gradually improved with time and technology. 
The Mars Global Surveyor mission, which launched in 1996, orbited Mars for 10 years as it built up the first complete and extremely detailed map of the full Martian landscape, along with much better information about its composition. Since then, we have even managed to send mobile landing missions to Mars, unmanned vehicles which have allowed us to roam parts of the surface freely. The first was Sojourner, which arrived in July 1997. Fifteen years later came Curiosity, a car-sized rover packed with equipment for analysis of Mars's soil. It landed in the 150 km wide Gale Crater and in seven years covered over 20 km of the terrain, taking detailed photographs as well as soil samples. We now have a permanent presence around Mars. No less than seven functioning missions are currently analysing the Red Planet, six in orbit and one on the surface, with more on the way. NASA operates three out of the six orbiters as well as the rover on the ground. The European Space Agency has the other two, and since 2014 India has also had a spacecraft in operation around it. And what most, if not all of these missions have found is overlapping evidence of something odd. It seems that Mars was once much warmer and much wetter, with oceans flowing on its surface. Many of Mars's features have been shaped and smoothed by flowing liquid and we can see evidence that water once flowed all over the planet. Mars was once more like the Earth than we ever could have realised. Today however, that is far from the case. Today, Mars is an extinct world, covered in deserts and impact craters. There is no longer any geological activity within the planet's interior to reshape the surface, as so many features in its crust have survived for millions and even billions of years. Mars bears the scars of countless impacts which occurred within the early solar system, including the late heavy bombardment, a period where asteroid impacts with the terrestrial planets peaked. This catastrophe destroyed over two-thirds of Mars's surface and likely drove away a lot of its early atmosphere. Because its surface has not changed much for millions of years, it has been physically rusting. Iron minerals in the surface sand have become oxidised, causing the soil to appear red, turning the sky a hazy reddish colour too. The planet is also becoming dustier with time. Dust storms occur across the surface of the planet and landslides speed down the Martian slopes at over 700 kilometres an hour. Mars has two permanent polar ice caps, made mostly of water ice, but encased by surface layers of dry carbon dioxide ice, which freezes down onto the surface from the atmosphere during the planet's winter months. Mars's atmosphere today is a very thin layer of carbon dioxide, nitrogen and noble gases, which offers very little protection from radiation from space. Because its atmosphere is so thin, heat hitting the surface of the planet from the sun quickly escapes back out into space. At its hottest on the equator, temperatures climb to around 20 degrees Celsius, but at their lowest, they plummet to minus 153 degrees Celsius. Like Earth, Mars is tilted on its orbital axis, and thus it experiences seasons. It completes a rotation every 24 and a half hours, surprisingly similar to a day on Earth. However, it orbits about 50% further away from the Sun, at around 230 million kilometres, meaning its year is a lot longer, approximately 687 Earth days. Thus, its seasons are much longer than the quarterly seasons on Earth and they vary in length thanks to Mars's slightly elliptical orbit around the Sun. Mars's terrain is split between rocky, elevated regions which have been shaped by volcanism and low-lying basins and channels which appear to have been carved out by water, but now constitute vast deserts. The sand of these deserts is a layer of powder-like soil, containing sodium, potassium, chloride and magnesium. And when NASA's Curiosity rover took a scoop, it found that 2% of the soil is still made up of water. These deserts sit atop a crust made mostly of volcanic basalt rock, estimated to be a few dozen kilometres thick. 
Its core is likely composed of iron, nickel and sulphur, topped by a mantle layer made of silicon, oxygen, iron and magnesium. Unlike the Earth's crust, which sits in pieces that interact with each other known as plates, Mars's crust is thought to be mostly in one piece, save for a few fractures and faults which formed early on in its life. Instead of constructive, destructive and transformed plate boundaries, molten rock within Mars once welled up to the planet's surface via faults and cracks, eventually bubbling through into huge volcanic plateaus which now line the elevated surface, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. However, this aggressive volcanic activity ceased eons ago and it doesn't seem like there has been a volcanic eruption on Mars for millions of years. One of the areas where Mars's primordial volcanism is most evident is the Tharsis region. Tharsis is a vast elevated plateau, formed by rising magma bursting into enormous volcanoes which can be seen from space, including Olympus Mons. Olympus Mons is the largest volcano, not just on the planet but in the entire solar system. It is a shield volcano which is over 25 kilometers tall completely dwarfing Everest and everything else on Earth. Its base is as large as the entire state of Arizona, large enough to be a state in its own right. Analysis suggests it hasn't erupted for over 20 million years, which I guess is a good thing. I mean, imagine an eruption from this beast. Imagine the time when all of the volcanoes were raging across Tharsis. Because the region is so high up, much of its expanse would have been frozen. Volcanic eruptions of this scale would have punched through the ice, dislodging and melting enormous chunks, which raged down from the highlands in floods on a biblical scale. The water rolled down land, sometimes off of huge cliff faces, creating enormous waterfalls, like the ones at Echus Chasma. Water rolling off of this cliff edge would have fallen a staggering four kilometers to the ground, more than quadruple the height of Earth's largest waterfall. In addition to its tall mountains, Mars also has extremely deep canyons and valleys. East of Tharsis, along the equator, is the Mariner Valley. It is a canyon which stretches for more than 4,500 kilometers across the equator, over a fifth of the planet's surface, and further than the coast-to-coast -coast width of the United States. The canyon is thought to be a crack in the crust which occurred as the planet cooled down following its formation, probably at the same time as the formation of the Tharsis region. It has since been widened and deepened by erosion. It is over 7 kilometers deep, several times deeper than the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Perhaps one day, mankind will be able to stand atop the Marina Valley and witness its awe-inspiring scale firsthand. Mars has two small moons which orbit relatively close to the planet. They are known as Phobos and Deimos. Oh wait, that's, uh, that's the wrong footage. They were originally discovered by Asaf Howe in 1877 and are named after the sons of the Greek equivalent of the Roman god Mars. In Greek mythology, Mars is known as Ares and his sons are called Phobos, which means fear, and Deimos, which means dread. Both moons have dust and rocks weakly attracted to their surface and small impact craters. They also have low reflectivity and appear to be made of carbon-rich rock, suggesting that the two did not form naturally around Mars, but instead are a pair of captured asteroids from the asteroid belt. The larger of the two moons is Phobos, at 22 kilometers across, but still smaller than Olympus Mons. It is estimated to weigh over one trillion tons yet its gravity is only a thousandth of Earth's, meaning the average person on Earth would weigh less on Phobos than the amount of sugar in a one litre bottle of cola. Phobos orbits a mere 6,000 kilometres above the surface of Mars, the closest of any known moon to its parent planet. But even from this distance, it is so small that it would only appear a third of the diameter of Earth's moon to Martian observers. Its low orbit means it circles Mars about three times per Earth day, and it is getting faster as its orbit is gradually being reduced and lowered by the tidal gravitational forces from Mars. It is spiralling inwards, getting two metres closer to the planet every hundred years or so. 
and so within 50 million years it will either crash into the planet and form a new crater or it will break up in orbit forming a faint dust ring around Mars. Phobos's sibling moon, Deimos, is even smaller but it orbits further away. It is a mere 12 kilometers in diameter and nowhere near large enough to be rounded by its own gravity. It has two large impact craters, significantly fewer than its brother. It takes 30 hours to complete a full orbit of Mars and is so small that it would appear as nothing more than just a particularly fast moving star in the sky. And unlike Phobos, it is spiralling ever outwards. Eventually, it will get far enough away that it will be ejected from Mars and out into space. No matter where you look on Mars, it appears to have been influenced, shaped and eroded by flowing water. We know that Mars has water at its polar ice caps today, but in order for its soil to be 2% water, it must have once been covered in it, like the Earth is today. But this was almost 4 billion years ago. Life on Earth had barely had time to begin. So the question is, if Mars was once a water world like Earth, then what happened to it, and why was its fate so different from our own? Like the Earth, Mars formed from rocky material which was left over from the solar nebula, the cloud that formed our solar system. After the Sun formed, the dust around it slowly condensed into rocks, which stuck to each other, eventually becoming large enough for the bodies to be rounded by their own gravity. Mars formed in violent circumstances, leading to radioactive decay in its core, which produced heat in the planet's interior the same processes which drive convection currents and geological activity on the Earth. When the planet had cooled from its primordial state and its internal layered structure had set, Mars began erupting gas and magma through new volcanoes, which cast a considerable amount of carbon dioxide into its atmosphere. The atmospheric layer thickened and the greenhouse effect warmed the planet. Heat hitting the planet was trapped under the atmospheric blanket rather than escaping, raising global surface temperatures and increasing the atmospheric pressure to a point at which water could exist on the surface. Meanwhile, asteroid impacts would have been bombarding the face of the planet, many of which formed further away from the sun and thus contained frozen water and ices. They smashed into the planet and the water within instantly vaporised in its early atmosphere, but over time the atmospheric balance of CO2 changed reaching a point where the water vapour could condense and fall as rain. This rain began to run into streams, and then rivers, and then vast lakes, and then eventually entire oceans over thousands of years, which covered 20% of the Martian surface. Mars had hit just the right equilibrium, and the red planet once turned blue. Mars had huge expanses of water on its surface for at least a few hundred million years in the early solar system plenty of time for weathering, erosion and perhaps even chemistry. The Iridania Basin is one such place where this is evident, an area on Mars which was once home to a nearly 4 billion year old ocean. This ocean evaporated long ago, but on the ocean floor it left behind, NASA's MRO spacecraft detected evidence of minerals produced by hydrothermal activity, likely originating from underwater volcanic vents on its ocean floor when mineral precipitates were erupting from the planet's interior. Life on Earth is thought to have formed under similar conditions to these. The geological activity in the Earth's crust burst through the sea floor, erupting chemical compounds at high temperatures, which mixed with water from which the first single-celled organisms are thought to have emerged. So, with the same vents on the floors of the Martian oceans, it is easy to wonder whether the red, then blue planet may have had its own awakening of life. Of course the idea is exciting, however even if life did emerge on Mars it likely wouldn't have been anything too complicated. Multicellular organisms on Earth took billions of years to emerge, long after Mars's habitable epoch, known as the Noachian era, would have ended. But still it is certainly interesting to consider. Sadly, Mars's Earth-like conditions were cut short, and an unlikely debt written at the birth of the solar system was paid. 
When it was born, Mars formed in a region of the solar system where Jupiter had passed through as it spiralled inwards towards the Sun. The gas giant had collected a lot of the rocky material in its path along the way, which meant less remained for the formation of planets, and as such, Mars is much smaller than the Earth and Venus. This smaller size and lower mass means that the escape velocity, the speed required to fly away from Mars's gravity, is relatively low, meaning that Mars is more vulnerable to the escape of its atmosphere as molecules are lost to space more easily. This took a heavy toll during the late heavy bombardment, when a significant amount of its early atmosphere may have been driven away by asteroid impacts and disturbances. As molecules were blasted out into space one cataclysm at a time, less heat was being trapped under its atmospheric layer, and much of the surface water began to freeze. The Noachian era ended as Mars began to go cold, but inside something far worse was happening to the planet. Like Earth, the heat in Mars's interior was due to radioactive decay, but these decaying planetary cores cool over time. Because Mars is small, its core cooled much quicker than the Earth's. As such, the geological activity in its mantle began to cease. However, as well as being responsible for reshaping the land through volcanism, Mars's convection currents played another role. The swirling of the magma created a current which generated Mars's protective magnetic field. And so, when Mars's interior cooled down, its magnetic field began to switch off, leaving its atmosphere even more exposed. We now know, thanks to the MAVEN spacecraft, that Mars's atmosphere is being eroded by the Sun. On Earth, our magnetic field protects our atmosphere from harmful solar radiation that is emitted from the Sun's corona. The field deflects the rays so that they don't erode the atmosphere. But after Mars's magnetic field switched off, these solar emissions were no longer being deflected away from the planet and the solar wind began stripping away molecules from the Martian atmosphere. Carbon dioxide and water vapour has been being lost to space ever since, dramatically thinning the atmospheric layer over a long time. Gradually, the planet's ability to retain the sun's heat has been lost, and surface temperatures have fallen drastically. In addition, the atmospheric pressure fell too low for water to exist in a liquid form on the surface, and so its seas and rivers gradually dried up and evaporated, doomed to be cast into space along with the atmosphere. The now bone-dry surface completely froze, and with geological activity ceasing in the planet's interior, Mars became frozen in time too. And so now, to this day, it simply stays there, rusting away and gathering dust, its valleys and basins empty. Mars was never meant to be a blue planet, and its habitable epoch had ended. But perhaps the story is not over. Mars has been thoroughly explored and mapped on its surface, and so now the next step is to get people touched down over there. Now we know what Mars used to be like, it might be possible to identify traces of life from the red planet's lost age in rocks and soil should life have ever existed on the planet. NASA's Perseverance rover will search for this, set to land in the Jezero crater on the 18th of February next year, searching for signs of life processes which have been fossilised in the rocks. But of course, there's only so much that can be done remotely. In order to start truly revealing the secrets of the red planet, mankind will have to reach it. And then, from there, the next step will be to establish and maintain a permanent human presence on Mars. At least, that's the vision of this man, Elon Musk. His company, SpaceX, is currently preparing for the most ambitious space mission ever conducted by a private firm. Musk's vision is to take both humans and equipment to Mars with the goal of setting up a colony, making Mars the first human-inhabited world on a planet beyond the Earth. That is a considerable leap forward in mankind's progress, and it is probably something that you and I will be around to witness. The mission is made possible by SpaceX's so-called Starship, a combination of their reusable spacecraft and heavy-duty launch vehicles. It will be launched in a two-stage process, whereby after reaching the outer limit of Earth's gravity, it will be refuelled for its long trip to Mars. 
It will be powered by deep cryomethalox, a near-freezing liquid propellant consisting of methane and oxygen, selected for use because it can easily be reproduced on the Red Planet. The whole thing will be the most powerful and advanced launch vehicle ever developed, able to lift payloads in excess of 100 metric tons. The first thing to go will be a pair of unmanned spacecraft, carrying an array of solar panels. This demo mission was planned to be launched in 2022, but it has now been pushed back to 2024, and it may be delayed further. However, following the completion of the unmanned mission, a few years after, a manned mission will follow, consisting of four ships, two carrying cargo, and another two carrying people. These astronauts will become the first people ever to stand on the surface of another planet, a privilege as honourable as it is enviable, but then the nail-bitingly hard work begins. At first, the astronauts will live inside their spacecraft, which has been designed with life support systems for early habitation, but gradually, the crew will assemble the cargo into an outpost, powered by solar energy and connected to the reusable rockets. Then, a series of both unmanned and manned missions will launch and continue to deliver people and supplies to the new colony, which over time Musk envisions being built up into a self-sustaining city. It's worth mentioning that this mission is far from guaranteed to go smoothly. Many have doubts over the realistic chances of the entire initiative succeeding without a hitch. We don't know if launching these vehicles back from Mars will be possible, and so these first explorers might never be able to come back, whatever the outcome of their groundwork. There are also numerous concerns over the effects of prolonged space travel, the physical effects of weightlessness and low gravity on the body, and long-term exposure to radiation which is undeterred by Mars's thin atmosphere. At present, it seems that these problems will be solved by nothing more than careful preparation and trial and error. But say we actually did it, and this human colony was established on Mars successfully. With the unbreathable atmosphere, inhospitable environment, and surface radiation, it doesn't seem like a scalable model. Perhaps a series of cities could be built to house up to a million highly trained people, but how do you actually colonise a planet in order to accommodate billions? Well, this is the next stage. Not just fortifying on Mars, but flourishing bringing it into an Earth-like state with a breathable atmosphere. This incredible idea of planetary engineering is known as terraforming, and it would be the process of reversing millions of years of damage to Mars by manipulating its climate. Terraforming is a wild scientific idea, but it could be done over a very long time in three stages. First of all, we'd have to warm Mars up and thicken its atmosphere. Then, we'd need to bring back water. And then finally, once we had a stable ocean planet, we introduced vegetation, and the end result is a true Earth analogue. A place beyond the Earth where one could stand without the need for protective clothing or breathing apparatus. In doing so, we would need to recreate Mars's early CO2 rich atmosphere, and for that we would need carbon dioxide. For this, we can look to the polar caps of the planet as a starting point. In the Martian summer, dry CO2 ice evaporates into the atmosphere, increasing its concentration by a third, before falling back down and condensing again in winter. This would be a good start, but not nearly enough for terraforming. So how do we get the planet hotter still? Well, one sure way to heat it up would be to drop a load of hydrogen bombs on it, generating heat through the process of pure destruction. But obviously, this would be unbelievably dangerous and incredibly unethical. Instead, we just need to play the long game. We would need to gradually warm Mars by inducing climate change on its surface, perhaps aided by the use of super greenhouse gases, such as hydrofluorocarbons, which are thousands of times more effective at thickening the atmosphere than standard CO2. As the atmosphere thickens, more heat gets trapped underneath it, and it thickens further, and we could use this snowballing greenhouse effect to our advantage but it would still take a hundred years or so to naturally warm the planet to the level required. A pretty long time for any human colony to wait, meaning the first Martian explorers will likely never see a blue Mars realised. But if it worked, 
then water from the polar caps and subsurface lakes with thaw and spill into rivers and channels across some of the Martian surface. The orange sky would turn blue and steam would condense in the atmosphere as it began to rain. However, this only achieves a carbon dioxide atmosphere. In order to create one with oxygen, which is breathable to humans, we would need to introduce life of our own. Moss and algae are two great species of vegetation for this kind of terraforming. They can withstand both high radiation and parching drought. They grow on rocks, turning them into soil, and then they photosynthesize, releasing oxygen as they remove carbon dioxide while dispensing organic matter and nutrients into the soil below, making it fertile. Before long, an old, dusty Martian cliff face could be teeming with life through vegetation. We would essentially be turning Mars's vast deserts into tundra. After many more generations of careful engineering, we would finally be able to grow trees, specifically pine trees, which can withstand radiation and spread their seeds through the wind. Before long, pine tree forests would dot the Martian landscape, acting as engines of oxygen to power the red planet's newfound biosphere. And while it would take hundreds of years, we could eventually restore Mars's habitable properties, turning it into an Earth analogue with the rich and stable environment that humans could live and thrive in naturally. Of course, these ideas are a long way off, but the fact that they could be possible gives you a real sense of hope. Hope for a second chance for the human race, on another world, all thanks to the miracle of technology. It would take a very long time, but hey, we're not exactly going anywhere in the meantime. Mars is a fascinating world, and whether we terraform it or not, it will most likely become the first planet beyond the Earth that humans will set foot on, probably within our lifetimes. Many people believe that the Mars Initiative is doomed to fail, and maybe it is an outlandish concept. But it is in good hands, and should it succeed, then the floodgates will open. Space agencies, governments, billionaires, NGOs, they will all rush to invest in the newfound vision for a new home for mankind. Once we do finally arrive on the Red Planet, humanity can finally say that it is a truly spacefaring interplanetary civilization, dramatically improving our chances of long-term survival and prosperity as a species. Mars is a vision of hope for mankind. It is not a way out, it is a way up. Upwards and out of the nest to take our first step into the heavens. A means not to start over, but to continue our story somewhere new. Mars may have once been a life-supporting water world which was lost, but even now, in its current state, perhaps we can finally start to believe that its best days are still yet to come.